Try I've heard the wicket described as fast, slow, taking spin, green, etc. Your commentator, Jim Laker, is the main culprit. Please tell JL and Co. that the wickets comprise stumps and bales and that the game is played on a pitch. I couldn't tell Jim Laker that. Frankly, I think he's earned the right to call the pitch anything he wants. Thank you, BBC, for the new comedy series from Kangaroo Land on a Sunday evening for the term of his natural life. It's so funny. We in our family have certainly joined the Laugh Till I Cried Brigade. Even after 11 years of hard labour, Refuse Dawes and his friend don't appear to look any older. Hold on, that's Rufus Dawes. Anyway, he and his friends... Seem ageless. What is their secret? Well, I think it's that beer they advertise on the test match coverage. You know, the one with the four X's. It's called XXXX. It is alleged in New South Wales, because in Queensland they can't spell the word beer. However, I digress. Here's Mrs Lower again. One request, however. Could you please show us a still shot of Patrick McNee in that hat? Is it really an old-fashioned coal scuttle? Well, here is Mr McNee in that hat. Hmm, nice. Mrs S. Byrne of Ashford in Kent sticks up for the Aussie soapy. They say that the accents are bad, the acting is wooden, and the savagery and degradations that were really the lot of the convicts in Tasmania was glossed over. Well, I've spoken to a dozen or so friends and relatives aged between 15 and 80 years, both male and female, and we all love it. But now, on a more serious note, here's Mr J. Crago of Chingford. I write following Thursday's episode of The EastEnders. During the programme, the tragic death of a young baby was enacted by the cast. It's obvious to most sensitive people that this subject is very close to the hearts of parents of young children. I feel that it's inexcusable to sensationalise this most heartbreaking situation in order to boost your viewing figures. Thus, Mr Crago. But how have other viewers reacted? Here's Anne Allsop of Sheffield. I found the programme harrowing and most upsetting. Anthony B. Rowland of Cottingham, North Humberside. To say that I was grossly distressed and upset at the contents of the programme would be an understatement. Mrs. Barbara Dean of Kenton called the scene... Heartrending. Mrs. Debbie Simons of Teddington writes... As a parent who has suffered the terrible tragedy of a cot death, I find it hard enough coping with my grief without seeing it portrayed in a twice-weekly drama series. And Mr. L.P. Goldstein of Barnet sums up what most have said. I cannot believe that such a scene can be justified on grounds of social comment, public interest, pathos, or to improve ratings. And doubtless discussion on the subject of what can and cannot be shown on television will continue here at the BBC. That said, there's no doubt that the East Enders attracts a large and loyal audience. That is, with the exception of Christopher Richards of Weybridge. The programme is an absolute load of rubbish. They used to have adverts on with people saying, I absolutely love it, it's so lifelike. Surely there have to be a fix. A fix, a fix. Oh, I say, you cannot be serious. No, those trailers, as we like to call them, at the BBC were what people genuinely thought. Mind you, the filming didn't go entirely as planned. Are we wondering if you'd like to answer some questions about some programmes? Oh, do, do, by all means, do. Do you ever watch a thing called EastEnders? No, I've been out of the country for a year, so... Have uh... you? <laughs> hey, master. That's very good. What's the question? Um. <laughs> what programmes they put on the BBC or it, or what they put on the television altogether, it ain't worth a penny. Do you mind answering some questions oh, about no. BBC programmes? No, I don't like BBC. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, we're from BBC Television, asking people questions about EastEnders and Wobit. Do you watch either of those programmes? Uh, no, I don't, actually. You don't? No, all I know is that the, the, the programmes on British television are f***ing better than the American ones. Oh, I see. OK. <laughs> you, must, you must admit, Joe, it's absolutely trash. A glimpse behind the scenes there. Now, I promised a comment on the weather. Well, here it is, courtesy of Margaret Austin Berry of Billingshurst, West Sussex. It has come to my notice recently that the weathermen at the BBC are shortening the words thunderstorms into thorns. Well, that's Francis Wilson on breakfast time. But I ask you, thorns? This word is not in the dictionary, therefore out of character for the BBC. If this is a new fashion, then may I suggest wane for wind and rain or scours for scattered showers? The whole idea is Billy. See if you can work that one out yourself. Billy? Billy? Oh, Billy. Oh, yes. Well, it is the silly season, and any doubt that it was were put to rest with the arrival of this letter from Amur Ali of Stoke Newington. And like they say on Allo Allo, listen carefully, we shall read it only once. Dear Took, or whatever, I'd like to compliment you on your absolutely brilliant programme. I'd like to hear other people's points of view on your programme, but a thought came to me the other day. I think that you make up the letters yourself. Well, of course I do, including this one. No, oh, hold on. Continue, Mr Ali. I'd like to ask you whether you wear trousers. 
Do I wear trousers? Yes, trousers, because we never see you below the belt. For all we know, you could be wearing swimming trunks, shorts, knickers, a G-string, a jockstrap, leather gear, jeans, flares, baggies, long johns, a skirt, a frilly dress, three-quarter trousers, plus fours, a leaf, a feather, see-through plastic bottoms, jogging bottoms, a curtain, a chastity belt with lock, bikini bottoms, kung fu trousers, or completely nothing. Baggies? Well, I'm wearing what I always wear. If you want to get on at the BBC, you, you have to wear this. I'll feed you later. But now back to business and the young ones. Here's Alison Haydock of Chester. Alison is 13. I have a question that's been bothering me for a few weeks. It's about the programme The Young Ones. I was watching it and suddenly I saw a single frame that seemed slightly out of place in the programme. The first one I noticed was on the 10th of June. It was of a pair of hands and a potter's wheel. The second was of a dripping tap. That was also in that programme. I watched The Young Ones again on Monday the 17th of June and the two in that programme were a flying dove and a leaping frog. Could you please tell me what is going on? I'm dying to know. Is it some sort of code? And should I get a prize for spotting this? Well, if there was any justice, you would get a prize, Alison. But as it is, hard luck. Now, if you at home have missed those flash frames, as they're called, here's an example. And here it is again in slow motion. Thank you, Withers. Now, why do they do it? Well, the answer is just for the hell of it. It's all part of the anarchy of the young ones, of which Eleanor Porter of Whitchurch, Hampshire, says... The BBC has no right to use the viewers' licence money to produce and broadcast such disgusting rubbish. On the other hand, the BBC does produce and broadcast programmes that people actually like, as Mrs E.F. Stock of Chelsea demonstrates. I do hope others besides myself will write to commend the marvellous performance given by Roy Marsden as Mr Chips. Every gesture, every inflection is perfect, and I find his characterization even more moving than the original version of the film. Please say thank you to him for a wonderful piece of acting. No need. You've done it. And then there's this from Jane Pollard of Hammersmith. Thank you, BBC One, for the pleasure of listening and watching that charming boy with the perfect voice. What a wonderful opportunity to sample his unique gift. What a shame the program had to end. The program in question was Omnibus, the treble, about Aled Jones, which, says Zoe Roebuck of Peterborough, was spoiled for me, as it must have been for many other people, by unnecessary conversation when Aled was singing. This talking when an artist is performing, says Zoe Roebuck, shows the insensitivity of the producers. Well, nobody could accuse us of insensitivity, so where to write to first, then Aled. Here comes the address. If you have any comments on BBC television programmes, please write to Points of View, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. Now, Aled Jones, from me until next week, goodbye. My word, there's a heck of a draft. I don't know where it's coming from, but I know where it's going. <laughs> A feature film on BBC Two shortly follows the legal and emotional repercussions of a drunk driving accident, Licence to Kill. On BBC One, in 25 minutes, the visit in which Dublin bookmaker Terry Rogers travels to Las Vegas to take on the professionals in the world's largest poker game, with more than a million pounds on the table. Showdown at Glitter Gulch. And that's followed at 10.15 by Match of the Day, in which you can see again Kevin Curran's sensational win over defending world champion John McEnroe at Wimbledon. But now, at 9 o'clock, it's time for the news with John Humphreys. Britain and America act to stop the terrorists. Arriving home, 300 Shiites freed by Israel. McEnroe over and out at Wimbledon and voted out the leader of the Knots Miners. The prince and princess having a Highland fling, 
and revving up the racy Vickers of Gloucestershire. Good evening. The American government is thinking of offering a reward to anyone who helps them catch the hijackers of the TWA jet. It would be for half a million dollars, the biggest amount allowed by law. The White House confirmed that the reward was under consideration while Vice President Bush was in London talking to Mrs. Thatcher about how to stop international terrorism. President Reagan has told Mr. Bush to come up with a plan and to get the support of other Western leaders. But Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Bush decided today that if the others don't go along with them, then they'll go it alone. They want Beirut Airport to be isolated by all the Western airlines. More pressure on any country that helps hijackers in any way and cooperation on security in general. The Reagan administration may look elsewhere for backing in economic or diplomatic matters, but Mr. Bush knew he should come to Downing Street to get support against terrorism. Together, he and Mrs. Thatcher came out with their list of proposals to put to officials of the seven main Western countries in Bonn next week. No country alone can do the job, and the thing I gathered here today at this historic place is the determination of the Prime Minister to lead uh, all across the world, including Europe, including working with the United States, in coming up with new answers to fight this problem that is just terrifying mankind. Terrorism and hijacking can strike from all kinds of airport. The Beirut hijacking was, I believe, of a different nature. Hitherto, the airport interest has been to stop and prevent the hijacking. In that particular case, the airport and the hijackers' interests seemed to be identical. That was what made this one very different. But a general boycott of Beirut Airport won't be easy. Air France still flies in and out there, and with several French hostages still in terrorist hands in Lebanon, the French government isn't likely to tell it to stop. What's more, Air France owns 28% of MEA, the Lebanese airline, which prides itself in carrying on as long as shells aren't actually exploding on the runway at Beirut. For the Lebanese, their airport represents a last link with the real world outside, and today travel agents in particular reacted angrily to the idea that the link should be cut. They won't close the airport, they wouldn't dare, because the consequences would be even worse. I don't think uh, Reagan will, uh, can do anything about that. None of the European countries could stop MEA flying to Europe, and we don't think we'll have any panic at all. But Beirut Airport, which used to symbolize business as usual in Lebanon, has come to represent the anarchy of a collapsing society. Hijackers know they've only got to get there and they'll be safe. Not that a joint American-British boycott would have too much effect anyway, if the French and maybe others continue to fly there and to accept MEA flights. The only way to close Beirut Airport for good would be to destroy it. And though the Americans won't want to do the job, it wouldn't exactly worry them if someone else, the Israelis for instance, did it for them. Israel has freed 300 of the Lebanese prisoners whose release was demanded by the hijackers. They left Atlit prison in northern Israel in a fleet of buses and were driven to Tyre to be reunited with their families. The Israelis gave the release the full glare of publicity this morning, inviting us into the prison camp at Atlit. It's a military prison which has been housing all the men picked up in South Lebanon in the past few months. Buses lined up inside had a military police escort. And just after eight, the first men loped out of the central compound. First held by the Israelis in camps in southern Lebanon, these men were then transferred back into Israel, a move that provoked much criticism. The majority are Lebanese Shiites and some are Palestinians. This morning, exactly 300, all Shiites, were let out. Though we weren't allowed to talk to them, they looked subdued and a little apprehensive as the 10 buses were filled up. They're referred to as detainees by the Israelis, as hostages by the Lebanese. But whatever their status, there's still an insistence by the Israeli government that their return is not in response to the release of the hijacked Americans. Heading northwards for the border and for transfer formalities supervised by the Red Cross, they no doubt anticipated that they would be welcomed home in exactly the same spirit as that accorded the returned Americans. They returned to Lebanon like conquering heroes rather than 300 men caught up, most of them unwillingly, in Israel's retreat from Lebanon and the drama of the hijack. 
The fact that they would probably have been released sooner but for the hijacking was not one to mention as they savoured their freedom and their newfound status. Israel always issues its released Arab prisoners with a tracksuit. They're worn in Lebanon as a sort of battle honour. A majority of these men were picked up by the Israelis in retaliation for attacks on Israeli soldiers by Shiite militiamen. They themselves were not involved in the attacks and have been held in effect as hostages against further incidents. But Amal, the Shiite Muslim organization, is doing its best to recruit them into its ranks, playing on their bitterness at their detention by the Israelis. The Israelis say the other 400 prisoners will be released as and when the security situation in South Lebanon permits. But diplomats involved in negotiations to free the hijacked aircraft hostages say that Israel assured the United States that they would all be freed soon. For those Americans held hostage, the process of adjusting to life at home may prove to be a difficult one. There are signs that the comradeship they shared during the crisis is disappearing. The universal question for returning hostages, had they been brainwashed? Were they victims of the Stockholm Syndrome, used to describe prisoners feeling overgrateful to their captors? I know about the Stockholm Syndrome, but I don't believe that it was uh, as intentional as that. It was uh, more propaganda to try to get us to believe in their cause and so forth. Yes. Justice should be served against the hijackers that are responsible for that kind of terror. The horrific hours before the murder of Navy diver Robert Steatham were recounted by a fellow serviceman. I could hear him screaming and yelling, and he was just in sheer agony. And then I heard the gun go off, and I could still hear him scream and yell. And all I could say to myself was, hang in there, Bob, hang in there. Somebody will come and get you. The hijacker came back where I was, and he was kicking me and hitting me and calling me an American pig. And then the stewardess rushed over, and she talked to him and said, no, please, please. And just at that time, I could hear several people with rifles and guns come aboard the plane, and there was a lot of commotion. And just at that time, the next thing I heard was, stand up, stand up. And that's when I thought it was mm. my turn. What has vanished already is the shared feeling of comradeship among the hostages. In the firing line, Alan Conwell, the Texas oil salesman who was the hostages' elected spokesman. Some now say he was too friendly to the terrorists. I just couldn't conceive of such naivety that a man of this intelligence could be so completely duped. This man walked on the plane in Damascus with a goddamn Koran under his arm, twirling his prayer beads. I went, I said, are you going to carry that into the goddamn White House? I'm having a hard time dealing with all this hero worship that's going on. I don't know what, what's wrong with America that they need heroes. Because uh, why are we being singled out like this, you know? If, there, if there's one person, it's that young man that was murdered. Uh, <sighs> the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev is to visit France in October for talks with President Mitterrand. It'll be his first foreign visit since he became the Soviet leader. In November, Mr. Gorbachev will meet President Reagan for the first time.